I'd like to welcome you this morning to our uh, live stream worship service from the United United Methodist Church. Uh, let's just be in attitude of prayer. Father God, what a glorious day you've given us. Though we're not able to meet as a body of Christ, we can meet in our homes. We can praise and worship you there. And I thank you, Father God, that uh, we can do these things just to continue to keep ourselves together as a family of God. And now this morning, the sermon is what everyone should bring to church. And you know, the church is not a building, it's us. So, Father God, everything that we do and say here is for your glory, not mine. It's for you. May your spirit flow through me as I bring forth your word. In Jesus' name, amen. See, people bring all kinds of things to church. Some people bring snacks. Some people bring candy. This is a pastor from the church himself, and he said, and I quote, I have seen people reading a book during the sermon. Some have balanced their checkbook. Some have uh, trimmed their fingernails. We've even found toenails on the floor. However, very few Bibles. Uh, Psalms 100 is a psalm of the future kingdom. It describes what worship will be like when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Uh, reigning in his glory and power forever. However, we're not in that state right now. But we are in the family of God and we are commanded to gather together. Together and worship him in his church. Not my church, not your church, but his church. In Hebrews uh, 10, 24 and 25, it says, Let us consider how we may spur one another toward the love and deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. But see, with that in mind, let's look at Psalm 100 and see what it tells us about worship as it should be. Uh, Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5, which is the whole psalm. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. He, for, he is the, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The first thing it says, we are told to bring the right spirit. We need excuse me, to be ready to worship the Lord even before we get into church. We should start preparing ourselves at home that when we get here, our hearts will be ready to worship the Lord. We are told to bring the right spirit. That is a shouting spirit. We are told to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Let's break this down and see what he's commanding us to do. First, there's the word make. That ref word refers to make music. In other words, sing out. Sing out to the Lord. Then there's the word joyful. Be joyful of what the Lord is doing in your life. Thirdly, there's the word noise, which means to raise a shout. That refers to a ringing cry. A cry that pierces the eardrum. Look at it this way. We all watch TV. And when we're watching a football game or a basketball game, we're yelling and screaming at that screen. Yet those people can't even hear us. In 
most churches, services, you can hear a pin drop. But when we shout out, the Lord hears us. When this is all put together, we can see that the psalmist is calling out on the people of the Lord to raise an anthem to praise God from their hearts. This is a challenge to participate in public worship of God's person and works. If you turn with me to Psalms uh, 40, verses 1 through 3, I waited patiently on the Lord. He heard me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the shiny pit, out of the miry mud. He set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to you, God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. See, this tells us what the Lord has did for us when he saved us. This verse tells us that he put a new song into my mouth. No longer am I singing after the world has what the world has to offer. Now I'm singing to the Lord who sought me and bought me and brought me out. See, the right spirit is a spirit of shouting. Remembering genuine praise is always vocal, visible, and public. God gets no glory when we hold it in. We are to come uh, uh, with a serving spirit. The word serve means to be in bondage. It refers to doing whatever the master tells the slave to do. See, when we get saved, we become the Lord's property. We are not our own anymore. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, it says, for you were bought for a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Therefore, we are to do what the Lord tells us to do without question or hesitation. See, some people don't like that already. They don't like anyone telling them what they have to do. Well, if you don't like that, you're not going to like this either. God tells us that we are to serve him with gladness. That little word means to accomplish with laughter. It's to be accomplished with laughter. This verse tells me that we are to serve the Lord with laughter. We are to be so filled with love for him that regardless of what he asks us to do, we should be tickled to death to do it. This is the attitude that fills David's heart. David's heart in Psalm 122.1 where he says I rejoice with those who said to me let us go to the house of the Lord. It brings to me the joy of a child when something happens that they like. If you notice it affects their whole body. Their mouth flies open. Their eyes get wide. Their faces light up, their hearts lift up, and their soul rejoices. Such should be the delight of us old sinners as we come to serve the Lord. We are to come with, to God with singing and with a ringing cry, a shout of joy. A heart should always be filled with the wonder of the Lord. Oh, of who he is, and what he has done for us. That without his praises to buff forth from our inner being. See, the first two verses of the psalm tells us that when God is in our lives, I really mean in our lives, not just on Sunday, but every day, we will not be able to hide him. <coughs> we will not be able to keep him a secret very long. We can't have something the size of God in our heart without letting him get out now and then. 
Sometimes you'll run out your eyes. Sometimes you'll show up in your raised hands. Sometimes you'll run up your throat and over your vocal cords and out of your mouth to make you shout. The fact is, you will not be able to hide him, no matter how hard you try. The next thing we are told to do is to be in right submission. We are to submit to the person of God. We are told to know that the Lord is God. This means to make a distinction. <clears throat> and we all know that he and he alone is God, not you or me. Do you have it nailed down this morning? Who is your God this morning? You might wonder, how can I know? It's simple. What do you give most of your time, attention, and money to? Is your God, is your God the God of the Bible? Whatever you answer to those questions is your God. By the way, if you ever get it nailed down, your soul should be just like God. And that he is superior to every person, everything, or every activity in your life. Then you have no problem serving him as you should. Next, we're reminded that we, <clears throat> that we are what we are because he has made us. That simply means to take some material and fashion it into something new. God took our old self and made it into something new. You see, God took clay that was used and formed it into a new creation by his power. When we accept the Lord as our Lord and Savior, he changed us. Not on the outside, but on the inside. <coughs> And regardless of what you are this morning, we are what we are by God's power. In 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 10, it says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. And without him, we can do nothing. In John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, we need to realize this morning that God saved us for a purpose. He didn't just redeem us to keep us out of hell. He didn't redeem us so we could look down our long religious noses and our lost neighbors and feel superior. He saved us that we might serve him and serve others. Ephesians uh, 2.10 says, For we are God's hand, we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Then in James uh, 2, 14 uh, through 20, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accomplished by action, it is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is a God good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish person. You do, you, fo you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? So you see, he has a plan for you. 
We are to submit to the promises of God. We are, to, we are the sheep of his pasture. This statement reminds us that we belong to him. And just as a shepherd looks after the welfare of his sheep, so the Lord looks after us with infinite care. See, David had this nailed down in his own life. And you and I need to get it nailed down in our lives. If we ever get a grasp that the Lord is my shepherd, it would forever transform us. We would realize that we never have to worry about our need not being met. We would never have to fear about anything else in life. We have his promise and his guarantee that he is in control. So if you're saying you belong to, good, to the Good Shepherd and he will take care of your needs that arise in your life. The problem is that many of us have not yet understood, never learned to trust him as we should. We need, we pray about a need and we promptly try to meet that need ourselves. See, you and I need to kick those props out that keep us, that hold us up, that support us and totally commit ourselves to God. Trusting in the Lord that he'll take care of us and watch over our lives. See, if we are his sheep, he will take care of it. The third thing is we are to bring the right sacrifice. We are to bring the sacrifice of praise. Notice the emphasis on verse 4. This verse tells us that we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name. Notice a couple of quick thoughts from this verse. One, God's house is to be a place to praise him. We are given an invitation to come into his presence and we are told to enter his gates. Verse 5 gives us three reasons for praising his name. We are to praise God for his goodness. We are told that the Lord is good. Everything God is an expression of his goodness. And we can praise God because he is good. Regardless of what happens in life, God is good. No matter how things turn out, God is still God. Therefore, praise him for his goodness. We are to praise him for his grace. We are to praise him for his guarantee. And when he tells us that he loves us, you can count on it. See, are you bringing the right things to church? Has the Lord spoken in areas of your life that need attention? If so, why not address them this morning and give them to the Lord? As he is, he is holding out his arms to embrace you and to take all your burdens away. You can come to him right where you are and you can give them to him. Why carry all these burdens? Why carry all these worries when we can just give them to the Lord? That's what he's there for. People go to counselors. They go here. They go there to get information when God has it all. And he doesn't charge you anything and you don't need an appointment. His doors are always open. You never get a busy signal. Because he cares for you, he loves you, and he wants to help you. <clears throat> we need to turn everything over to the Lord. Yes, we're going through tough times right now. But you know what? God is still in control. There's nothing to worry about. Let's pray. Father God, what a glorious time that we can have spending with you. I believe this time that we are shut in and locked down, it's time to spend with you. It's time to get our lives together and, and, and see where we really stand and we do we really love you. Do we really understand who you are? Do we really understand the power that's available to us at this moment? And now, Father God, we ask you to be with us protect each and every one of those out there today, no matter what they have to do. 
put that hedge of protection around me. In Jesus' name. Amen.